Hey, y'all. So we're going to go ahead and get started. One, two, um, just to honor y'all's time and also because we are talking about the relationship in the Godhead, which is incredibly difficult. And so I need an entire hour to be sure that we try and address it. Um, <laughs> if, if you haven't gotten a handout, I think they're going to go print some more. If you are of a couple situation and you both have one, maybe you could offer one if you are around somebody who doesn't have one. Um, does anybody need one currently? Okay. I think we're, okay. I think we're good right now. Thank you for those who are offering. Okay. So the boys all left me to cover the Godhead on my own. Thanks. Um, <laughs> uh, so it's going to be me today, and I am so honored that you all are here. I'm so excited that you guys want to think about these things and talk about these things. I'm sure that there will be questions. I will do my best to answer them. Um, we will always boil down to it being a mystery. Sorry. And uh, this is the fourth and final week of the Trinity. So those of you who've made it each time, well done. And if you've only been here once or twice, still well done. Uh, we are so happy um, that we're just able to cover this content. This is kind of what I spend my life doing. So it's fun to just be able to share it. Uh, I don't have any announcements other than <laughs> this is this is awful, and I am going to blame my husband for this publicly. He, <laughs> we didn't look at um, the, the role for who had attended, and he, and he pointed out, like, we're not going to know until everybody's here. So we have the book. I want to prove that we have the book that we said we would give away. But you have to come back next week <laughs> so that we can actually see who has come all four times. And then, or if you don't want to come back, then we will um, email you and we'll mail it to you. But this is, the, this is one of the main books that we've been using. It's called None Like Him um, by Feinberg. It's huge and intimidating, but it's amazing. All right, I'm going to go ahead and pray, and we will get rolling. Heavenly Father, I am um, humbled to be here to be talking about you. And I pray that the things that I say are true, and I pray that um, they are said in a way that they are understood. And um, that everybody in this room, including me, that we would all just walk away from this in awe of you and in awe of the way that you have, that you have sustained your church um, and you have sustained truth and truth about you through your church through all this time, Lord. We lift this up. We ask that it would um, change the way we live, that it would change the way we worship. And we just, we ask that this time would just be honoring to you. In your name, amen. All right, so we have talked about God the Father. We've talked about God the Son. We've talked about God the Holy Spirit. And so this week, which looking back, we probably should have done first, and we apologize, <laughs> lesson learned. We are going to talk about the Godhead. So that means the, um, the relationship within the Trinity, and then we're going to talk about what it looks like when those things have been understood poorly in church history, which you'll see all of the different graphics and everything in your handout. But first, before we get to heresies, which is the exciting thing, uh, somebody told me that this is like shark week, but like it's like heresy week. So uh, we, we, um, we're going to talk first about just the Trinity itself. We're going to talk a little bit about what, um, who God is, uh, and then we'll get to heresies, which is who God is not, or how not to understand it. But first we're going to talk a little bit about how to understand the Trinity and the, and the few things that are, are quite key. So Why? Why the Trinity? The term itself isn't actually in the Bible. So why do we hold to that term? Why do we even, like, think about God in this way? There, uh, does anybody have a thought on that? Why? Why do we 
why did the early church feel like they needed to come up with the Trinity, come up with the concept? Anybody brave? Yeah. Yes, yes, to a degree. What um, She said to try to explain the inexplicable. So what is the inexplicable that they were trying to explain? One plus one equals one. <laughs> one plus one plus one equals one. Yes, but the, one of the key things is there is a tension in Scripture. So we, we have the Trinity because there is something in Scripture that has one God, but it also seems, and, and there very clearly, Scripture communicates one God. And you see that in your passage list, the Deuteronomy 6.4, Isaiah 45.5. That talks about there being one God. Okay, so we have this truth asserted by Scripture that we have committed ourselves to be led by. But then we also have scriptural truths that talk about what seems to be three different persons or three different manifestations, three different something that this God who is one is somehow three different beings in some way, or persons, we're not sure. Um, so you see, again, in your passage list, John 15, 9. Um, you see John 15, 26, and, uh, the Son sends the Father from the Spirit. Matthew 28, 19 has Jesus commissioning all of us, really, but the disciples in the name of these three something. So... Um, How do we faithfully represent both biblically-based ideas? That is the, that, now if you, you have to put yourself in the shoes of the the disciples and the early church a little bit to understand the situation that they're in. So they, like let's say the disciples and, you know, however many were on the hill when Jesus ascended, they all stare up, there he goes, the angel says this thing, Okay, so what do we do? Okay, the angel told us to go back to, okay, we're going to go back. And so then they're in this room waiting. Then they get the Holy Spirit. Pentecost happens. Oh, my goodness, all of this. This is crazy. And then all of a sudden the Spirit's leading Peter to, to like, preach this sermon. And if we read it literally, 3,000 people were saved. So now all of a sudden those people who were standing on the hill are the leaders of this new religious, at least, sect of Judaism, if not new religion. They don't know yet. And they're kind of all sitting there talking, trying to figure out what happened. <laughs> and so they go, they go back to the, the, the scriptures, which for them was the Old Testament. They start writing down everything that they remember Jesus teaching. <laughs> they write down the Gospels. And, and so then they're... They start, um, and, and they're progressing, and they're just passing that around, and, and they're meeting together and, you know, living together. We see Acts, you know, sharing everything, all of that. They have this community going on. And then, as all of that starts just multiplying, there's some people who start saying some things about the, this tension, about this one God and these three persons being something, three manifestations, we're not sure. And, and the church and the people who were on the hill, the people who were with Jesus and those who have become leaders since are kind of looking at it and saying, that doesn't sound right. So if you, um, we're not going to go there yet, but if you flip forward a little bit to the shorthand definitions. It'll be on your second, the back of your second page, because I'm about to throw out some names, and I don't want you to be like, what is she talking about? Um, so the Ebionism, which was people basically saying that Jesus was only a, um, the Jewish Messiah. He wasn't really a, um, he wasn't really God. He really died. He didn't come back to life. He wasn't anything. So these Ebionites are saying this, and, and so the people, again, who were on the hill and leading all of it, kind of start hearing that, and they're like, 
well, that doesn't seem right. No, that's not, Jesus was God. That's part of what we're saying. And he, he did rise from the dead because we saw that he did. So no, you're going to need to be quiet. And if you don't, then you don't get to call yourself a follower of Christ because this is the way that followers of Christ understand Jesus and these biblical tensions. But we're still working that off, out. We just know that it's not that. So then there were some other people who kind of pendulum, okay, well, he was only, he was only really like an illusion. So he really was divine, but his body, the human form, that was only an illusion. These do, the docetists. Well, again, the people say, well, that doesn't sound right. No, because we saw him eat. We saw him die. He was fully human. So no, you don't get to call. We're not exactly sure what to do with these biblical, <laughs> this biblical tension, but you don't get to call it that either. So that happens again with the adoptionists, and that happens again with the modalists who, say, who were saying that it was really one God and just three different manifestations. Um, so sometimes he would, he would manifest himself as the Father. Some, you know, Jesus' presence was him manifesting himself as the Son. Pentecost was him manifesting himself as the Spirit, but it was really just one, one God. Um, so you have all four of those are happening and the early church <laughs> is getting hit by all these sides and these people who are trying to figure this out. And, um, and you know, and, and they're working their way to an understanding of these, this biblical tension as they hear people making suggestions as to what it is. And these are all believers who are saying, well, maybe it's like this. And the leaders say, no, we can't go there. It's not that. You know, and so it's really, have you ever, this actually, <laughs> this drives Travis crazy. When somebody wants something, but they don't really know, they, can't, they don't really know what they want. And so you keep being like, what about this? No. What about this? No, that's not it either. Okay, well, what is it? So that's where we land when we get to Arianism. And I'll pick that up in a second. That's when the church got serious about it. But I want to put, I, I want to put that a little bit in perspective because Sometimes we have this idea of <laughs> the early church fathers and the disciples knowing exactly what they were doing and saying yay and nay. And they certainly were trying. They were empowered by the Holy Spirit. And they were being led for sure. But it was a process that sometimes I think we lose sight of. And um, it, yeah, I will stop beating that dead horse. So all that to say, why the Trinity? Because there's a tension in Scripture and also because if we don't talk, if we don't establish something, other people will. And so the church came to the understanding that they needed to establish what the Christian way to think about this biblical tension was going to be. So the word Trinity, like I said, isn't found in the Bible. It was developed um, to try to do justice to this. And they, what they came up with is what you have on um, this little, on the sheet that says our basic definition, this is what they came up with. They came up with the term Trinity. They came, they, and this is quite remarkable, actually. They, <laughs> they created or distinguished, they made a longstanding linguistic change where, um, being and person before this meant the same thing. After this, it meant two different things. And it still, today, in current secular philosophy, still means two different things because of what happened here. So they came up with a very specific meaning for substance or being. And they came up with a very specific meaning for nature and a very specific meaning for per person. And they said, this is what it means to have a Christian understanding of these, of this biblical tension. One true God eternally exists as three persons, so one true God would be the substance, uh, eternally exists as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one in nature, equal in glory, and distinct in relations. So we look at that, and we had an excellent, excellent question last week about the logic <laughs> 
of this, because we look at that, and, and you even mentioned one plus one plus one equals one. That doesn't seem logical. Um, so I want to address that just real quickly. Uh, first, I want to couch it in um, there is no really great way to explain this. We'll get to that in a second. So everything, even the, the diagrams and stuff that we're giving you, fails at a certain point. But one way to think logically about this is um, language is very important. We don't claim that there are three gods that make up one god. We claim that there is one god who eternally exists as three people. So, um, the word is has different meanings in English. So, you can have a, a meaning of, like, strong identity. So, if A equals B, okay, this is philosophy and logic, so we're going to have to do math a little bit, and I'm so sorry because this isn't my strength either. But if A equals B, and if B equals C, then we would say... A is C. And not just like, is like it. A is C. If A is B and B is C, A is ontologically C. Um, that's one way is can be used. But there is a second way that is can be used, and that's more of a member of a class. So Fido is a dog. So if Fido is a dog, and Fifi is a dog. FIFO is not Fifi. Fifi. I should have come up with different terms. Names. <laughs> okay, does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so that is the, the way in which we sort of, again, it breaks down at a, at a certain point, so that's not like perfect. But that's the way that we think of it and is one kind of logical defense for the Trinity. Um, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, but the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit, just like Fido is not Fifi. Um, God created logic, so we want to try to understand that, yes, but I will also point out that God allows mystery, and so sometimes we have to admit the limits of our logic and just worship and recognize how God has revealed himself and whether we fully understand it or not. But there is, I, I didn't want to just punt to mystery too much, um, too quickly, I guess I would say, because there is importance in trying to work it out logically because God is a God of logic and he has given us that ability and we need to respect it. I am terrified to ask, but are there any questions? <laughs> yes. Okay, can you say that a little bit louder because I didn't hear the end part. Hmm. Okay, did everybody hear that or should I repeat it? So she said, one time it was explained to her that like one plus one plus one equals one. That doesn't seem to be logical, but it, especially if you have a mathematic brain. But infinity plus infinity plus infinity equals infinity. Perhaps my mathematicians and logicians, that will be helpful for you. All right. Um, moving on, we're going to, I want to hit this real quick because heresies will take a while. Uh, are there any other questions? Yes. Three twenty five AD was the Council of Nicaea. Yeah. Yes, but that's where that's why I actually walked through um I yes, what you're saying is true. Um but that's also why I walked through the the first four 
heresies that you have on the shorthand definitions because those four were actually going on before any of that. So it was a matter of them trying to work it out. And then Constantine, when he came to power and with the church, it, yes, it became political, but it was, it was a doctrinal question that they were working out as the church before it ever became political. All right. Um, the relationship in the Godhead. So I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Uh, they are eternally one because we've already talked about a lot of this stuff in the previous weeks. They're eternally one. Um, the, uh, John 17, 5 shows that the, the Son shared glory with the Father before creation. And they're of one substance. Jesus claims to be the I am of the Old Testament. We talked about that two weeks ago. Um, and so they are all eternally one. Uh, the Father is known as the divine fount. So for him, the Father begets the Son, and that's called generation, and he begets the Spirit, that's called spiration. Uh, so the Father begets both the Son and the Spirit, and we talked about that last week when we talked about the filioque, which is when they added the and the Son to the Nicene Creed. All right, the Son is eternally begotten, which makes sense if the Father begets the Son. The Son is eternally begotten. Uh, there was never a time when he was not, and he is, uh, he is begotten of the Father, but he is not created. That is very important, and you'll see why in a bit. The Son is eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son. Again, we talked about that with the filioque, so I'm not going to dig into much of that. Father is the divine fount, the Son is eternally begotten, the Spirit is eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son. The acts of the triune God, so that's the substance of the triune God is eternally one. The acts of the triune God are inseparable. This is where the confusion on week one, <laughs> for those of you who were here when I was talking about the works of the Father, and somebody was like, yeah, but didn't like Jesus do that? Too? Like, I'm confused. This is the acts of the um, eternal God are one, are inseparable. Uh, God always acts as one. It is from the Father, through the, seer, through the Son, by the Spirit. You've heard me say that several times now. From the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit. That's kind of the formula that the church has really kind of settled on. So, yet, the actions of the Trinity... So they're one, but there does, uh, scripture at times seems to primarily ascribe one person over another. So when we talk about creation, we're typically talk, we typically say that that is an act of the Father, though we go back and we see, no, it really is the one God acting inseparably. So the Son and the Spirit were a part of creation. Sanctification, the Holy Spirit is typically given the role of the primary actor, but it's also the Father and the Son. You know, it wouldn't be possible without the Father sending the Spirit to do that and the Son's work on the cross to make that sanctification possible. So it's an eternal, it's an eternal inseparable work for all of them. Heresies. So when we try to solve this tension in any other way than what we just described— we get heresy, <laughs> and, and you don't, and you disagree with, um, you refuse to go in line with what the church tradition has said. So how do you, is anybody aware, I'm sure, this is a really common illustration, so I'm sure somebody, does anybody know how you are trained to spot counterfeit money? By rubbing and touching real money. Has, ever, has everybody heard that illustration before? Maybe, maybe not. Okay. Um, you are, the way that you are trained to spot counterfeit isn't to go see all the different ways that it's been counterfeited. It is to actually spend most of your time with the real money. And so when something comes across your path, you automatically look at it and you say, this isn't it. This, you know, it feels wrong. It looks different. There should be some, no, like this isn't it. I, I can't exactly point out right now what it is, maybe, but I, I can tell you that this is not real money. So, welcome to week four of Trinity Counterfeit Training. <laughs> so, 
show. I, um, everybody turn to this, this page where it says our basic definition and orthodox Christianity. You are all now going to be trained in Trinity counterfeiting so that when something comes across your path, we're just going to, we're going to hammer what it is into you so that when something comes across your path, you can be like, ah, I'm not sure exactly what's wrong, but something's wrong with what you're saying. All right, so one God, right? So that means one substance existing as three persons. One God, one substance existing as three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. All right, the, that's the first one. Orthodox Christology is down here. We have um, Christ. Let's see, because we haven't spent as much time on this. Christ is one person. Christ is one person and two natures. One person, two natures. 100% God, 100% man. And we will talk about how people have tried to figure out how that all fits together and the ways that it is not okay. But if you are ever in doubt and you are like, I don't know, can I say that about Jesus? Just default to saying 100% God, 100% man. How it works, I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> but 100% God, 100% man. <laughs> and don't let yourself go any further. <laughs> um, all right, so each person each person is God. So each person is God. Each person is one substance. And each person is not the other. So one God, three persons. Christ is one person, two natures. Each person is God. And each person is not the other. All right, that was counterfeit training. Here we go. Here's the people who made it possible for us to be able to say those things. Um, you will want to keep your shorthand. Oops. You'll want to keep your uh, shorthand thing accessible. Shorthand definitions accessible. So we already talked about Ebionism a little bit. Um, I found this shorthand. This, this is not mine. I uh, borrowed this from somebody else. It's just incredibly helpful. He, that is saying that this is almost all talking about Jesus because that's kind of the context, again, because they were all trying to figure out, okay, so how is Jesus a part of everything we see in the scriptures and all of that? So all of this is about Jesus. So Jesus is only human for the, Ebion, for the Ebionites. Um, and some of the... I would suggest that perhaps modern day, this could be... There are scholars who would fall into this category, who would say, yeah, he was kind of this Jewish Messiah, or he thought that he was. He, he, really, he really died. There really was, he wasn't divine. He wasn't anything like that. So some scholars, I don't want to say all, but some would actually fall into this type of heresy. Uh, docetism, we've talked about, is from the Greek word doketai, which means illusionists. Um, that is that Jesus' form was an illusion. That's kind of what, if you've heard of the Gnostic Gospels, probably from the Da Vinci Code, which would be the modern day version of this, um, this is what that is talking about. Uh, that is this heresy. And, they, and that book and all of that was going back and saying, oh, well, there were really all these different like, accounts of what happened and this specific one, um, you know, the account that we call orthodoxy won out but all of these other things could be true too. And so that would be the docetists that we see there. Adoptionism. So this says that Jesus was a sinless man. So he really is man. They affirm the divinity, or I'm sorry, the humanity of, of Jesus. So he was sinless. And so God looked down on that sinless man and said, wow, that's the one. I'm going to essentially adopt him and he will become the Christ. So he like was brought into divinity, but he was not in eternity past as an equal member of the Trinity, three persons, one substance. Uh, the, yeah, I'm not going to go there. Um, any question? Wait, I'm going to go through modalism and then I'm going to ask for questions because Arianism is kind of a big deal. 
All right, modalism, I've already talked about God being a single essence um, and a single person. So it's one person in just manifesting himself in three different ways. Has anybody ever heard somebody use, the, uh, use water as an illustration for the Trinity? Raise your hand if you've heard of that. Yeah, that's modalism. So don't, 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 don't use water. <laughs> that's actually, because that's one substance manifesting itself in three different manners, rather than it being three different distinct persons, which water can be a person. So again, they all break down. But that's actually modalism. Um, does anybody know of a current Christian tradition that might fall into this? Modalism, yeah, this idea of there just being one with different manifestations. Hmm? No. You mean sarcastic? Okay. All right, so this would be, if you've heard of oneness Pentecostals, this is actually what they hold to. They hold to God being one, and he manifests himself in three different ways. There's a couple ways that this can happen. It can either be that he just manifests himself however God will, in three different ways, or you can look at it, and um, some people look at it and say that God has manifested himself three different ways in time. So he was the father in the time of the Old Testament, he was the son in the time of the Gospels, and now he is the spirit in the church age. So that's also a form of modalism. Um, But if you hear one Miss Pentecostal, if you see it when you're driving by something on the highway, you can be like, ha, there's modalism in in, in action. (laughs) So, um, does anybody have any questions on these first four? Again, these were the ones that the church was kind of dealing with on its own before it felt like, ooh, I think we need to call a council for this. Yes? Yes, thank you for asking that, Chandler. Um, she asked if this is a specific type of Pentecostalism or if it's all Pentecostalism. No, it is a very specific type um, that actually arose in the t- early 20th century. Pentecostalism started in about 1900, and it arose in that first century. And they, so there's oneness Pentecostals kind of broke off at the very beginning of Pentecostalism. So if you have Pentecostal friends, or if you are of a Pentecostal tradition, I am not labeling all Pentecostals oneness. Thank you, because that's not true. Yeah. Yes. They say, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Um, The adoptionists say that Jesus was not, let me see if I get this right. Jesus, or I'm sorry, Mary was not the mother of God. She was the mother of Christ. So that's how, that's how they talk about it. They understand it differently, again, because he was eventually brought into that role. Yeah, that's how they, that's how they talk about it. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. No, because the Holy Spirit proceeds from both the Father and the Son. He said that it's better that I go because one will come who will, who will do that. I can't remember the exact verse. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But, yeah, because Jesus in, in those passages talk about Jesus even breathing the Holy Spirit. When, I think it's the Acts passage where Jesus is be, right before his ascension. He says that he breathes the Holy Spirit on them. And that's one of the defenses for the filioque, which was the addition to the Nicene Creed that um, that the... Son and the Spirit and the, I'm sorry, that the Spirit and oh, the Father and the Son, there it is, the Father and the Son, um, like, send the Spirit. So, no, no, they're not closer to each other because they're, they're co-equal. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Ooh, no, I'm not. don't, again. Um, it, okay, we need to go back to one God, 
and his actions are inseparable. At times they are, one of them is in the account of scripture, is given the, the role as the primary actor, but it is one God with inseparable actions. You can't think of, you can't, you can't split them, split the persons up like that. It just doesn't work because then you're violating the, the one substance. All right, Arianism. This is where things got real for the, for the um, early church. Let me get to those notes. So Arianism said, Jesus is divine, but he was created by the Father. So he was the firstborn of creation. So what's, what's wrong from what we've talked about? Trinity counterfeit training, what is wrong with that? Go, go ahead. Eternally begotten of the Father. Exactly. So that, and this is where in, the, in Arius' defense, this is where they figure that out, and they for sure say that. So he wasn't violating that at this point. But go ahead. Yes, Anna? Yes, yeah, exactly. Anna? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it violates co- yeah, it violates co-equality. Okay, so there is a, it's saying that there is a time when Christ was not and that he is subordinate to the Father, not because he has placed himself there, which we're not going to get into subordination right now, but not because he has, um, like, humbly placed himself there, but because he was created by the Father. Uh, So this is why the first council was called, because it it is complicated, um, and I'm not going to go too much into it. Okay, yeah, I will. So so the Arians had a case, okay? So we want to be fair to them. The Arians, uh, the verse in John 14, 28, this is not on your passages, I'm sorry. So John 14, 28 says, the Father is greater than I. John 3, 16 says that he's begotten. Um, and again, this is before the begotten language was established. Uh, Col- Colossians 1, 15 calls Jesus the firstborn of all creation. So the Arians, are, as they're trying to figure this out, are saying, what do we do with these passages? This seems like this is what it's saying. So those against the Arians, though, were saying, yeah, but John 10.30 says, I and the Father are one. And it talks about them being eternally begotten, and it talks about supremacy. And so it can't just be what you're saying. And remember when we talked about a couple weeks ago, um, oh, what was it? That one, the kenosis. Do you all remember kenosis, the, the idea or that some theologians said that Jesus emptied himself of divine attributes? And it was really all based on in an, one interpretation of this one passage in Philippians and how I said we can't just base our theology on one passage. So in this, in the, in the argument f- against the Arians would be we can't ju- this, just base our whole theology on these three verses and throw out all of this other stuff. We have to come up with a way to figure it all out. So that is why, the, and, and it was becoming very bitter, and to um, the comment earlier, political, and so Constantine said, we've got, to deal, we've got to deal with this. And so he called the Council of Nicaea, and Nicaea landed with just what we talked about. So that, it holds back. So what I'm establishing as orthodoxy goes all the way back to 325 AD. And if that seems like a long time from Jesus, if you look at that and you say, well, yeah, but that's like 300 years after Jesus. So 300 years ago, what was happening in the United States? The creation of the United States, precisely. All right. My... Let's see. My grandmother, now I will say, so my grandmother's grandmother, she was a very young bride. <laughs> so that's, that said, my grandmother's grandmother was married to a, pers- to a man who fought in the Revolutionary War. So let that sink in. E- fine, let's even add another generation in there. So, like, my great-great-great-grandmother 
if my grandmother told me something about that man, that soldier, that she had been told by her grandmother, who was his wife, would I be like, oh, it's been too long, that can't be true? Well, probably not. I mean, maybe. We'd look at it and say, okay, I mean, if I could have some kind of, like, journal or something, it'd be great, but, like, I'm not going to fully just call you a liar because that would be you calling your grandma a liar, which doesn't make any sense. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to call my grandma a liar. And so, like, that, think about, like, generationally. It sounds like a long time to us, but really, it's not that far. And so if they are, if the people who were on the hill are passing down, this is what we saw. This is who Jesus is. This is what happened to us. This is, we, we were standing at the tomb, and he, you know, not at the tomb in the garden, I guess, but, like, he walked up to us. And so their grandchildren's grandchildren are sitting in a gathering, like trying to think about and talk about that. Nobody is really doubting that. So just to, just to put that in perspective, it's really not that far. Anyway, back to Nicaea. This is what they landed on. Um, and after Nicaea, there was a shift in the thinking. So everybody kind of said, okay, Jesus' divinity, we've all established, we've said that this is what it means to be a Christian. If you're not saying that, you're going to be outside of our, out of our, like, belief system. But then how does Jesus, how is Jesus human? And so that's when you get these, uh, the last three. Um, oh, by the way, Arianism. Does anybody know a modern day Arian? Arian tradition. Jehovah's Witness, yes, I believe so, yeah, and Mormonism. Both of those, I know for sure, and I, I didn't look at Jehovah's Witness, but I think you're right. Um, they believe that Jesus was created, and so just be aware. That's what, that's what we're dealing with, even like we're still in the line of this tradition and talking through those things and distinguishing ourselves, you know, and, and Mormons often will say, oh, no, we're Christians, and Christians will say, Hi. and this is why, right here, where we say, no, 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 because you believe that Jesus was created, and I don't. So that makes us, that has, means our beliefs are fundamentally different, because that's at one of the core of our faith. All right, so the last three we see are Apollinarianism, which, so this is, again, remember, they're trying to figure out the humanity of Jesus now. So Apollinarianism said that Jesus was always divine. So, like, so you, you think of, like, Christ being the eternal sent one. Okay, so Jesus is always divine. But then he kind of got put inside a human shell, kind of like a coconut. So, like, it's, <laughs> it's, like, brown on the outside. It's human on the outside. But the inside, oh, it's white and, like, glowy and divine and logos. That was um, Apollinarianism. And they, the, the early fathers, and at this point, if you've ever heard the Cappadocian fathers, uh, they were very instrumental during this period in figuring out all of the, They were actually the ones who figured out the linguistic differences. One of them, Gregory of Nazianzus, argued against this, saying, and this is very fundamental in Christian theology even today, what is not assumed is not healed. So whatever Jesus was, which is 100% God, 100% man, whatever he was is what was healed. So if Jesus was just a divine being, if a divine person shoved into a human shell, that is not 100% man. So then that means man is not healed. Whatever is assumed is what is healed. So that was the argument and remains one of the huge arguments for anything talking about in, in Christological conversations. So then we have two others. Nestorianism said that Jesus' two natures are radically distinct. And here it's helpful to look at the really big one, 
which would be so much better in color, but I'm sorry they didn't make it in color. Uh, if you look at Nestorianism, it's number eight. It's almost at the very end. It's down on the bottom where it's like more, Jesus says more human. <clears throat> and if you see, there, the, the light one is supposed to be like 100% God, and the, the darker one is supposed to be 100% man. And do you see that there's a line in between? So the idea with Nestorianism is that he is like his, he would act out of his divinity, and then he would act out of his humanity. But it wasn't one person, one nature working. Or I'm sorry, one person, not two natures. Um, but it wasn't the one person doing something out of the two natures. It was either this one is acting or this one is acting. So we talk like that. Like in this church, I've heard it. I've probably said those kinds of things. Where it's like, well, in, in his humanity, Jesus did this. Ooh. Just be aware. Like, it's okay, because there's language betrays us at a certain point. We have to be able to talk about something. But, but be aware that, like, you have to be really careful when you're saying things like that, because you could be slipping in, without knowing it, into something that you don't actually believe. All right, and then the final one is Eutychianism. So this is kind of like Jesus is a smoothie. So um, Jesus, they would, <laughs> they would say that Jesus has a single fused human and divine nature. So, and they just kind of all got mixed up. So he's like human and divine altogether, which you can understand if we're saying 100% God, 100% man. That kind of makes sense. You know, you're like, well, yeah, because, and, and they were trying to say he's not acting out of, he, they were actually responding to the Nestorians. They were saying he's not acting out of his divinity or his humanity. It's all one. But in saying that it was all just kind of fused together into a human and divine nature at the same time. Okay, Trinity counterfeit training. What's wrong with what I just said? His human and divine nature were just kind of fused together. There are two natures. And this is where that got hammered out, saying, no, 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 no. There are two natures. We can't say that they're just all mixed together like a smoothie because what is assumed is not healed, or what is assumed is healed. And if he is this weird amalgamation of divine and human, then he is neither really divine He's neither 100% divine, nor is he 100% human. And so his sacrifice is not efficacious for humanity, which doesn't seem to say, which doesn't seem to, to correspond with what we see in Scripture and what Jesus said about himself. So we can't, we can't say that. We have to say this, two natures. So that, those are some of the key heresies. Um... I, on the back page, I included the major councils of the early church uh, that we're not going to walk through this, but I just thought it would, I really like this because <laughs> it's helpful. Um, so these are, it, the, it's, the seven ecumenical councils are kind of a really big deal in Christian history. And uh, you'll see, you'll recognize most of the, the heresies that we've talked about on here. Those are the councils where they kind of said, yeah, no, uh, we've got to figure this out. Those conversa these are those conversations and when they happened. Um, I will tell you, typically our tradition, uh, the Protestant tradition, we wouldn't fully disagree with councils five through seven, but we really mainly hold to councils one through four. Just the reformers kind of put a line there. So for what it's worth, though, you know, again, nothing, it's nothing like major that we would disagree with, but, but be aware that typically in Protestant and especially in evangelical Baptist type traditions, we would really hold ourselves to councils one through four. All right, and then I also included just this little, after, now that you've been through Trinity counterfeit training, you, I included this, uh, graphic of the evangelicals today. So if you look at it, it says, um, it shows you just where evangelicals are and what they like naturally 
you know, on whatever default click thing that this <laughs> was off of, what they said. So God the Father is more divine than Jesus. Um, Jesus is the first creature created by God. Whoa. Like, look at all of that. Like, in 20, a quarter of the evangelicals surveyed don't even know how to answer that. Like, that's, that's scary. If you think about that, if you really think about it, that's scary. So I just thought that you would find that interesting. Um, and then this I gave you to just put all of the, to put all of the uh, heresies kind of on a timeline of the first 500 years of the church, more or less, four or 500 years, and to see kind of where they landed. And then if you've seen on, on the top is the divine. So those would be the people who, would say, no, Jesus is more divine, and this is how. Um, and then down here, it would be where they were struggling with his humanity. Any questions? Yes. Uh-huh. You know, I, I'm going to be honest, I haven't studied Arianism a ton, and so I, I don't know the specific arguments off of the top of my head that Arius was making um, as far as, I, I know the, the passages that he was using, but I don't know where the, where the point of contention was as far as like, okay, so are we talking about function? Are we talking about, you know, I, I, I'm not sure, to be, to be honest. Yes, Chandler. You're welcome. No, no, no. No, okay, so let me, let me address that because I think that is important. We are all fallen human beings. We all recognize that probably as Baptists. We hold to total depravity for the most part. That we, um, our minds our bodies, the world in which we function, are all marred or completely shattered by sin. So, this idea of orthodoxy is probably not completely correct as to the true nature of the Trinity. Please hear me not saying that it doesn't matter. It does, because I believe that the Holy Spirit guided the church through this whole process, and has made it clear, as clear as maybe we can understand, though it's, it's still, we question whether it's logical, um, about himself. And I believe God has revealed himself even through this process to a degree. So don't hear me say that it's not important. But we are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ on our behalf. We are not saved by our correct beliefs. So, Yes. <laughs> so please don't ever, and maybe I needed to say that sooner, but thank you for asking that, Chandler. We, it is important because, like I said, there is a Christian tradition that, and I, I cannot think of the passages off the top of my head, but I'll, I could give them to you later, um, that it, in the New Testament where it talks about, like, 
um, Paul is talking to Timothy about like the passing on of the faith and Peter talks about like the faith that was passed on to us. And so we stand in a long line of Christians, of Christ followers who have now been given the responsibility to pass on this story, the story of the people on the hilltop. It is partly our responsibility, especially years now that you've sat in four weeks of Trinity. Um, And so we want to pass that on the best we can, the most faithful witness that we can. And so that's why it is important and why these conversations on orthodoxy are important. But again, you are not saved by your beliefs because there's a good chance that some of these things are wrong or they're not complete, and that's okay, and that's the mystery, and that's why we have faith in in the Lord, but we also recognize and we believe that the Lord has revealed himself, and so we have to have faith in that self-disclosure, and that self-disclosure has happened through the scripture, through Jesus's presence on earth, and through his, the church body, and I mean to a degree, again, please hear me saying that with all of the caveats that need to be had, because we are not Roman Catholic. (laughs) So that would be a distinction. But does that help, Chandler? Yes. All right, so how does this change how we worship? All of this, all of these details, all of this, you know, Jekyll Hyde, coconut, water, what is, you know, all all of this. How How does this change how we worship and how we live? What, what changes for you all? I'm kind of throwing that out to you guys. And he resurrected from the dead. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, he said that it, it brings a sense of reverence to the worship. And... And even today, I was, as, we were re- as we were singing, I was in the chapel service, and we were singing a song, and it was about, like, joining the voice of, you know, the eternal chorus or something like that. And, and I think of this, and I think of, like, man, there are believers 2,000 years ago or 1,500 years ago who believe the same thing I do. And I have brothers and sisters in Christ all the way back then, who were doing everything they could to pass this message on to me. Like, I am, I am in awe of the Holy Spirit for maintaining that witness. I am in gratitude to those who've come before me. And I am in a little bit of fear that that is now my role. And I take, and that's an actual responsibility that I now have as a Christ follower. Anything else was stood out to you all over the course of the four weeks or however many times you've been here? How does this change how we worship or how we live? We don't want to just talk about ivory tower things and lots of little discussions. They're relevant and they matter and they should. Yeah, DJ. Yeah. It's something that you definitely have to step into. That's actually my personal uh, salvation story is lots of intellectual doubts. And I came to the point where I realized, like, I'm not going to know. And I could be wrong. But, like, I'm stepping into this and saying, no, like, all my, all my chips, all my chips are in with him, with the God of the Bible, with this orthodox narrative. Here's where my chips are. And that's all we can do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Yes, that's actually, that's um, a close to a maxim of the Eastern Orthodox Church, uh, because it, who very much embraces the concept of mystery and is, are very comfortable if they cannot explain things. They say an incomprehensible God is not God. So, okay, I, it's 12 o'clock. I want to hear from all of you. I really do. Um, but I want to honor everybody's time. So I'm going to pray and come chat if you want to. Oh, Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for, um, God, just thank you for your truth and for your love, and that your love has been communicated and passed down to us through our brothers and sisters. And we just ask that you would give us the strength and the discipline and the, um, the care <laughs> to pass it on to others, Lord. And um, we, I just ask that the things we've talked about would not um, be in vain, Lord, and I just um, pray that anything that I said that wasn't true would be forgotten as soon as everybody walks out. And we just offer up the rest of this day and pray that it would just be a wonderful day of rest for everybody in this room and that they would be able to reflect a little bit more deeply on who you have revealed yourself to be and um, grow just a little bit closer to you in the process. In your name, amen.